So, uh, so far, uh, we've uh, got a, a quick overview of some of the Java Lang classes, some of the Java IO classes, and um, we, uh, uh, oh, once again, I forgot to start the timer. Go for another 40 minutes, then take a break. Um, and we, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the assignment. What I, I want to do for the rest of the class, and this is an experiment that, that I'm trying this term, is to do some coding with you guys. I'm going to write some code, and I want you guys to ask questions. I'm going to be talking to you uh, about it, and then uh, depending on how things go, I might want you to come up here and help me write some code. Um, here again, this is something I've never done before. I think it'll be okay, but if uh, you find yourself falling asleep or if it's like totally not making sense, you gotta let me know. Remember what like we talked about last week. You've got the remote control, right? And if you need me to, you know, speed up, tell me to fast forward. If you need me to rewind, say something again. If you need me to pause, so you can have a moment to think about it, let me do that, okay? Okay. Um, so I think what I wanna do is, um, okay, you know what? First of all, um, we're gonna watch a movie. So uh, let me uh, give you some some background here. Um, there is a uh, industry luminary. I don't know how you call him. This guy named Bob Martin, Uncle Bob Martin, um, is is how he goes. And he's written um, over geez, close to the last twenty years now, a lot of good books about programming and developing. As a matter of fact, he's one of the key players in the um, so-called software craftsmanship movement. Um, it, it's interesting. Over th There's been, uh, here again, in, in my relatively brief career in, uh, in software engineering, uh, there's been you know, this whole like, wave of, of agile development techniques and agile project management, management and things like that. And um, that's gotten a lot of hype, but what hasn't gotten a lot of attention is you know, how you go about doing your job every day and sort of like good fundamental programming practices. And Uncle Bob has, um, uh, has, has in, in addition to writing about good, you know, uh, agile, uh, you know, project management practices and things like that, he's really focused in on the craft of, of writing code and writing software. Um, and, and one of the things that I've found working with my interns in the PSET program is that while uh, in school you guys get a lot of good uh, fundamentals about the language and sort of the machine and the math or anything like that, um, there, there are sort of just things that you haven't gotten exposure to in terms of how you structure your code, the importance of uh, good method names, good variable names, um, and it makes a big difference when you start writing code professionally, especially when you're writing code that other people are going to look like, which, let's face it, it's all code, right? I mean, everybody looks at each other's code. Um, and so th this has really been on my mind uh, the last couple of years, and I'm trying to figure out how to integrate into the class. And I think the, the, the first the first sort of software craftsmanship thing that um, that I want you guys to experience is test driven development. So. Um, Last time we uh, talked a little bit about JUnit. There's a screencast on JUnit. Um, and so JUnit is the framework that you use to write your unit tests. But there's sort of this whole philosophy behind um, how and, and, and why you write unit tests. Um, and uh, Uncle Bob, the way he pr presents it is in this, uh, th these three phases, red, green, refactor. And I touched on this last week, but I want to reiterate it. Um, when you do test-driven development, you write your test first. So you're thinking about what you're going to need to do. It's like, okay, I'm going to, uh, he's got this like bowling application. So he's thinking about the, the logic of the bowling application. And so, you know, okay, you're, uh, I have a game and you can, a bowl, uh, sorry, a, a frame uh, of bowling and you have at most three turns. And so, okay, uh, I'm sorry, this isn't candlepin bowling like we had in New Hampshire growing up. You have what, two in 10 pin? How does this work? So the, okay, so uh, sorry. Side note: um, in northern New England and uh, and in Nova Scotia um, and parts of uh, Quebec, um, we have something called candlepin bowling. Um, and candlepin, so so, so it's, it's very much like ten pin bowling, like they have in the rest of the world, uh, except for a couple of things. Um, first of all, instead of using like this big, huge, heavy ball, you use a smaller ball that's about the size of a shot put. Um, and uh, there are 10 pins, but instead of like bowling out of the ball, they're more like a candlestick, they're more cylindrical. 
Um, this is totally irrelevant. I hope you're fast forwarding on this through this for the podcast or in the in the screencast. Anyway, um, but I'm sharing my native culture with you. That's what it is. Um, bowling of New Englanders, anyway. Uh, and 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 uh, but because the uh, the the pins are smaller and because the ball is smaller, you need more than two times down the, the alley in order to uh, to knock it over. You guys are all paying way too much attention to this. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, and and uh, but, but but another important difference is that you, know, you roll it down and it knocks down some subset subset of the ten pins, and. Um, Instead of the thing coming down and sucking up the pins and sweeping them away, the fallen pins stay there. So part of the strategy of the game, then, is to use the pins that have already fallen to knock down other pins. Anyway, but that was completely irrelevant. Instead, what's relevant to bowling is that there are, or what, what so you get two chances to roll balls down there and that, uh, um, you know, the, at, at each frame has a score, which is the sum of the bowl. Uh, of, of the number of pins that have been knocked down. And then you have all the rules around strikes and spares and all that other good stuff. Um, and so this is the, the example that, that Uncle Bob is going through. And when he wants to uh, develop his bowling application, he first writes, this, writes the tests for it. And he goes through this red-green refactor thing. So the first thing that he does is he writes a test which is complete, but he knows it's going to fail because he hasn't written the code for it. So he's got to write enough code just so that it will compile. But so first he writes this test and it fails. So the bar is red. It's failing. Then what he does is he goes through and implements the application, the bowling application, enough so that the test will pass. Just enough so that the test will pass. And so even though, yes, there are glaring holes and lots of other stuff won't work, it doesn't care. You focus on getting just one simple thing to run. And after you go back and run your test, it's green. Then what... Um, then, then what he does is he goes back and he refactors it, meaning that he goes and cleans it up a little bit. So maybe there's some variables that need to be renamed, or maybe he's found there's some duplicate code that he's introduced. He's going to move that into one place. So this red-green refactor thing. Um, now, uh, Uncle Bob is a unique character. This is coming from me. It is, is, is a unique guy, and he has a certain flair for uh, for presenting things. So not only does he talk about uh, this red-green refactor thing, he's got this hat with three brims on it. One that's green, one that's red, and one that's blue. And he talks about like the various like you know phases that he's going through. Um, this, and, and so what I want to share with you now is a five-minute clip from uh, a, a, of an episode of this clean code um, video series that he has, which actually I've, I've Tripwire has purchased and we watch them at work. And they're weird and cheesy at times, but actually it's pretty good stuff. Um, well worth, you know, instead of getting like some ugly sweater for, from your aunt from Christmas, you can, you know, ask for this stuff instead. Um, anyway, uh, let's spend five minutes and, uh, and, and take a look at this. So let's full screen it. Oh, and let me... Um, I don't know how loud it's going to be, so let's give it a try here. It's time for the red green refactor cycle. Oh, and this I dude has no idea what's going on. Phase. I must write a failing unit test. All right. What test must I write that will force me to write public class game? Well, I'm going to write um, uh, can create game. Uh, game G equals new game. Oh, heavens. Thank you, IDE. Helpful, IDE. That's enough of that. Heavens, to Murgatroyd, that doesn't compile. Well, I must make it compile. So now, I'm going to create the class game. Yes, in the current package. There it is, the class game. And if I go back to my test, oh, look, the test passes. It's time for me to go. To the green phase, I am now green. And in the green phase, it's time for me to refactor. Is there anything I can refactor here? No. Nothing to refactor. Very good. Then I am done with this test. I am passing. Lovely. Back to the red phase. The next test. Well, I know I want to write that roll method. All right. Uh, test. Um, can roll. 
Uh, oh, heavens, I need a game. Uh, game G equals new game. Lovely. Uh, G dot roll, what should I roll? Well, let's roll a zero. Hmm, that doesn't compile. Okay, time for me to focus on making it work. Uh, I'm going to create the method roll. Ha, look at that, roll. And it should take a pins. This is lovely. And I believe that that will pass. Because I'm not actually testing anything. Oh, time for me to refactor. I've got a passing test. Uh, what's to refactor? Oh, goodness. I I mean, so you see what he did there? He didn't try to implement the roll. He just got it to pass. And obviously I'll have to do it later. But the whole idea is that you go step by step by step so that you can catch things along the way. We've got duplicate code here. Duplicate code. Well, I better take that and refactor that out. I'll create a field named G. I will initialize it in the uh, setup method, which of course I don't have, but this will create. I'll keep it private. Lovely. So now I've got a nice setup method. It's going to create the the, the <coughs> game. It'll put it in the public in the private field G. Uh, can create game is now empty because well it doesn't do anything. And um, I think I can get rid of that line of code in can roll. And all of this should still pass. It does. I think I can get rid of that empty test now. This is common, by the way. You write a test just to delete it later. Lovely. Hmm. Next most interesting test case. Back to red. Well, what can I make fail now? Um, oh, I gotta write the score function. Ooh, but I can't call score until I roll a complete game. Okay, so here we get into some of the technicalities of test-driven development. When you must write real code, you write the simplest real code you can. In this case, I'm going to have to roll a complete game. What is the simplest, most degenerate complete game that I can roll? A gutter game. Let's roll the gutter game. Uh, okay. Um, um, four. Int. I equals zero, I less than how many balls in a gutter game? 20. Mm -hmm. uh, I plus plus. Uh, G dot roll zero, that will roll 20 zeros, that is a gutter game. And now we will assert that the score is zero. Oh heavens, that doesn't compile. I must make it pass. Excellent, I will make this Compile, it should return an int. I'll have it return a negative one, because I still want to see it fail. It should fail, yes, and now I will make it pass by returning a zero. This is stupid, but it's also easy. And I have now seen my test both pass and fail. I know my test works. It cost me nothing. But I now know that's another important point that, uh, I mean, cause, and, and probably not in the last couple of seconds here, but you can, uh, you can trick yourself into thinking that your test actually does something unless you see it fail and then you make it pass. That my test will fail if I don't get a zero. Ah, well, that was nice. What is the next most interesting test case? Or is there any refactoring to do? Mm, no. Next most interesting test case. Okay. And anyway, uh, it goes on. Wow, it fades out and everything. Happy coding. Okay. Yeah, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't test the uh, the spelling. Um, anyway, and I'll uh, I'll post. Actually, I'll just post it to the Google group or to the um, community now. Uh, here's the video that we watched in class. No, oh. there you are. It's not YouTube. Name. That's oh, a link. Of course. Yay. Anyway, go. In case any of you guys want to catch it up later.
Um, so anyway, I'm I'm a I'm a pretty good fan of of Uncle Bob. Um, I like what he has to say for the most part. There are a couple things that he, he talks about that I sort of disagree with, um, but it's a it's a good place to to learn and some place that I always start my uh, my new programmers um, on. Okay, um, so let's see here. Um, last time we uh, is that readable? Yeah, everybody I think you can read that. Okay. Um, last time we talked about uh, Maven archetypes, and we looked at the student, and uh, I started a screencast on it, but I haven't gone all the way. I think what I want to do is um, start from scratch with that program, because you guys are going to be doing it for your project one, so I just want to walk you through the phases of working with the Maven archetype again. Uh, we'll probably, that'll probably take us up until break, and then we'll come back and we'll do some, some more coding um, for that. So... Let's go back to the assignment. Oops, that's the text file assignment. That's the slides that we're not interested in. Instead, here we have student. So this is that um, sort of project zero um, that, uh, well, it's sort of becoming an example project. So um, as you'll recall, this uh, what, what we have here is a um, simple student class that extends human. Human is one of my classes um, from the object-oriented programming. Um, lecture, which I don't yet have a screencast on. Um, not super high priority for it because I think you probably know most of that stuff, so um, not available right now. Anyway, student is a human, it's got a constructor that takes arguments like name, uh, the number, the, the classes that the student takes, student's GPA, and also the student's gender as a string. Um, and the student uh, says this class is too much work. And uh, there's also a string representation that can be returned uh, for the student. And there's an example of it down there. Um, and then there's also a main method. Uh, we'll skip that just for a second. But uh, here on the command line, you give the student's name, gender, GPA, and then the uh, classes that the student is taking. And if you give it this command line with Dave Mail 3.4 3.64, algorithms, operating systems in Java, you want it to print out a string that says Dave has a GPA of 3.64, is taking three classes, algorithms, operating systems in Java, he says this class is too much work. Yes. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> let's let's go through it, and because um, I want to come back to that uh, question, let's get some code to look at, because I think it'll make a lot more sense. Okay. So this is the assignment that we have to do, and to get started, I created a Maven archetype for it. And remember that Maven archetype is sort of like a template project that you can do a little bit of customization for, and poof, it'll give you a place to start. Um, and the reason I'm going over this in such uh, detail is because you'll be doing the same thing for your project, and so I want you to see a couple of examples of it, because it's, it's something that's probably new to you. Oops, so we'll delete the stuff that I did earlier today. Okay, so I went and I'm going to copy this big old command line, which is saying, Maven, go off and create me a project from an archetype, with all sorts of details that you can read up on, if my computer doesn't freeze. Hello. There we go. Um... Copy that and paste it. And recall that there's this problem with the tilde, so it's going to fail the first time. Really got to figure out how to fix that. We'll go back and change the pretty tilde to the old school big ugly tilde. So this goes off, looks for uh, the archetype um, from a catalog that's hosted up on my website something called with the group ID of edupdxcs410j and the name of student archetype. It's now creating a new project. It's asking me what the group ID for the project should be, and that's going to be edupdxcs410j. And then your, uh, since it's your project, will be your group ID. Uh, for me, it's going to be Whitlock. For you, it's going to be your login ID. The artifact ID is going to be student. The version is going to be, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter, 1.0 snapshot. Package, the package for the, the class is going to be the same as the group ID. What the heck? As you confirm all of this, say yes, it goes off and creates a student directory 
That contains your palm and your source. And actually, if we just look at the source, it has main. Oh, I'll mute my. There you go. Noise it has a student.java, and it has often test a student test.java. Um, I want to put this in version control uh, into Git, but I don't want to use GitHub because um, I want to be able to check it in. But there's not something I'm going to share with anybody else. Um, so I'm going to use a, call, a command called git init, which will create a local git repository. And now I can do a git status, and uh, it says that your that no files have been added yet. So I can add the palm.xml to git. I can add the source tree to git. Now if I do my status again, I'll see that okay, great, all of this stuff is ready to be committed. So uh, I'm going to commit it just so that I have sort of a checkpoint in time. Um, let's say committing the uh, project files created from the Maven archetype. Oops. And I'm going to commit everything in that directory. It looks like it committed some stuff. If I run my status command again, yay, everything's clean. Questions? Nope, OK. Remember, remember you, have the, you have the remote control. You can pause, you can fast forward, you can rewind. OK, so now I've got some files. Um, I want to work with them in IntelliJ. So I'm going to make the uh, IntelliJ project. And I do that by saying maven idea idea. It then created the student IML IPR IWS. Um, I want to open up the IPR class. Oops, it opens it up too big. OK. It tells me that there's an unregistered git root detected because it doesn't know about uh, the fact that it's in git. I'm just going to simply add it. It looks all happy now. OK. Uh, okay. So, so I have my Maven project. And now I'm going to go ahead and, like I said in the assi assignment, build it with Maven package. Maven package will compile the application code, compile the test code, run all the unit tests, build the jar file. Um, but if any of those uh, initial phases fails, then the, it won't try anything later. Maven package, uh, I got a build failure. Why? It has this error, constructor human, uh, constructor human in class, blah, 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 cannot be applied to the given types. String, found no arguments. OK. Let's go back, and I want to find my student class. Um, I can do that by either browsing uh, through the files like this, but um, I am, oh, it's too bad that it's so small you can't see the names of all the menus. I can go to navigate, and I can say class, and I want the student class. Oh, good, it finds it for me. Here's the student class, and oh, look, it's underlined all sorts of things in red. And I'll try to make it a little smaller so it fits on the screen. It's got this red constructor here. So I'll hover over it and tell me there is no default constructor available in JavaLang Human. So um, every constructor must invoke either another constructor in the same class or an inherited constructor from its superclass. And if you don't um, specify, if, if you don't either call you know this with a couple of parameters or super with a couple of parameters, um, it will assume that you are calling super with no parameters. And the reason this is failing is because well there is no default constructor, there is no zero argument constructor in JavaLang Human. Okay, so I'm going to browse up here to the um, and I'm doing this by hitting the command key and uh, hovering over the Human class. And I'm going to click on that to browse into the Human class, and sure enough, it's got one constructor that takes a string name. Okay, So I need this, uh, this um, constructor to call the other one. So I'm going to say super name. So that'll call the super classes constructor, humans constructor, with the name argument. OK, that's good. Um, notice that the student class here is still underlined in red, and that I've also got some red dashes over here, which means that there are more problems. So I can click on it to go to the next one, but I can also say what, navigate to next error or something, next highlighted error, F2. By the way, I, I'm a big fan of keyboard shortcuts, and so I'm going to point it out once, but then I'm just going to use the keyboard shortcut because it's faster. OK. So uh, this method isn't compiling because it's saying missing return statement. Absolutely correct. The says method is supposed to return a string, and it returns nothing. So we need to make it return something. Um, well, you know, uh, 
I, the, the job doc says that all students say this class is too much work, but I'm remembering back to that Uncle Bob video where it's like, I want to make things fail before I make them work right. So I'm going to have it do, I could have it, well, what are my options here in terms of things that I could do for this method? How can I make this thing compile? Could return null? Anything else? Yeah, I could return an empty string. Um, I'm going to be even more uh, more draconian than that. I am going to throw an exception because this isn't implemented yet. And so, like, why guess an implementation when I can just say I'm not implemented yet? So I'm going to throw a new um, unsupported operation exception. Uh, no, when I hit U, it, it remembers that I use this one. You can type out unsupported operating exception. You can hit tab to get the rest of it. But I can also do this thing um, that IntelliJ supports where I can uh, type in the, uh, the initials or the abbreviation of the class. So if I say new capital U, capital O, capital E for uh, unsupported operation exception, it'll highlight that one. I can hit tab, and it auto-completes for me. Um, and now it's prompting me for the uh, arguments to that, uh, that, that constructor for unsupported operation exception. I'm just going to give it a string that says not implemented yet. Okay. So, okay, now it's compiling. I don't see any red here. Uh, but I've got some red here. I'm going to hit F2 to go down there. And actually, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm just going to cut and paste this guy, put him down here. Everybody's compiling. Everybody's not implemented yet, but everybody's still compiling. Looking over here, it's yellow because it's telling me that there are three warnings found. Um, I'm going to go to those warnings here. And what is it saying? Oh, yeah, the classes parameters never used, GPAs never used, and genders never used. I'm okay with that right now. Um, okay, I've got things compiling. I'm going to try to run the package again. Compile source code, it ran tests. There were two errors during the tests. Okay, well, I want to look into that next, but I want to make a checkpoint. Because um, I've gotten my, my, my code to at least where it's compiling. Um, I want to make a checkpoint by committing my code back to, um, back to the Git repository. Um, oh, couple, so I'm going to look at my changes uh, that I've made to my source code since the last time I committed it, since the last time I checked it in. And I'm seeing that I've made some changes to the student, which I know I, which I, know I did. There are also these unversioned files, the student IML and the student IPR. Um, these are the IntelliJ files. I don't want to check them in to Git, um, I want, but I want them out of my way. I'm going to ignore them by editing my Git ignore uh, Oops, uh, by editing a file called git ignore, where I can put in um, pattern matching, uh, well, what are these called? File wildcard matching things um, for, for those files. Um, and then uh, if I go and refresh here in IntelliJ, Oh, awesome. So now it got rid of those two and tells me, oh yeah, there's this git ignore file that uh, it doesn't know about. I want to add that to, that, that actually I want to check in. I'll add that to, uh, to VCS to git. Now it's telling me there's two files that are under uh, revision control. There's green, which means it's been added but not checked in, and then student is blue because it's been committed but not modified. When I first commit my git ignore, um, ignore the uh, IntelliJ files. Commit that. Now I'm going to commit my changes that I made to student. Um, get the student class compiling. Uh, it's telling me I've got three warnings. That's all very nice. So those three warnings with those unused uh, parameters, I'm going to commit that. Okay, I've got no changes. Uh, everything's good. I'm ready to go. Any questions on that? Make sense? Okay. Okay, so uh, I've got everything compiling. I've, got, I've made my checkpoint. Everything's in version control, but I've got tests that are failing here in student tests. So I want to go look at the student test class. I'm going to do command N to find student test. Oh, I remembered the last thing I typed in. That was nice of it. It's going to arrow down to student test and open up that thing. Okay. 
So I've got these two uh, tests here, invoking main with no arguments as x code of 1, and invoking main with no arguments prints missing arguments to standard error. Okay, uh, I'm going to run them, and the way I run it is by going up to run, and I can say run here with, what is that, option shift F10. Well, let's run it from here this time. And it's, oh, it's asking me do I want to run just one uh, test or run all of them. I'll run all of them. And it's telling me two of them are failing. And I apologize about the screen resolution. Is there a way for me to make that smaller? Oh, there is. That is pretty awesome. I still can't make it big enough to read, mind you. Okay, so it's telling me that it expected one but was null on this assertion right here at Hamcrest. Okay. So, and maybe this is starting to answer your question. Okay, so um, actually, could you ask your question again so I can make sure that now that we've got code in front of us that we can answer it? Mm. Good question. Okay, so uh, th this over here on the left, these are the files that are there on disk, and there are two um, sets of source code. There is the source code for the application, student, and there's a source code for the test, test. And both Maven, Maven and IntelliJ are smart enough to know, or actually we've configured them, to, to say, hey listen, code in the source main is application code, code in source test is test code. And because we've told Maven IntelliJ this, they know to compile you know, both of them, um, have this be test code, and it knows, uh, it, it knows that student test is a test because it has things like the test annotation. No, it's really about where the um, where, where the fi where the file is created. If it's created under the test directory, <coughs> then it's a test. If it's created under the main directory, then it's application code. Yep. Are those packages test and main? No, they are not packages. They um, those are actually directories. So looking here in IntelliJ, if you look at the icons, this little um, uh, file folder with a green thing means it's a package. Um, the I believe that the file folder with the blue background, like Java here, means that it's uh, an application package, and green means test. I'm pretty sure that's what it means. Okay, so there is a package. The test, I mean, they follow the same sort of rules. Ah, yes. Um, so uh, best practice is to have your test in the same package as the same package as your application, but they're in different directories. Um, so that you can, for instance, uh, you know, jar them up separately, stuff like that. Good question. The JUnit is just Java test cases within the same package? It's, yes. It, it, it's, so JUnit is a framework that includes annotations like at test and other things, assert methods and stuff like that, that um, let you write, uh, that let you write tests. And, be, and IntelliJ and Maven will then treat something, well, will treat something that has the at test um, annotation as a unit test. And so it'll invoke the JUnit framework, um, and then JUnit will look at this class and say, oh, look, you've got an at test method. I will run that as a test. Okay. Those are really good questions, by the way. Thank you for asking them. Student test is a, uh, is a test class. Oh, you know what? Because I have my sound off, this thing might have... Uh, so I will turn it on a little bit. Actually, no, I'll just unplug it because you guys don't need to hear all that. Um, oops. There we go. Um, so student test uh, has this invoke main with no arguments, has exit code of 1. OK. Uh, what do I do here? I have a method called invoke main, which takes a student class. And this will invoke the main method of student and returns this main method result. And main method result has this method called get exit code. And I expect it to be equal to null, but if we go back to my run, it said it was null. Well, 
That's true because I believe exit code ca captures what is uh, what is sent to system.exit and we never call system.exit from our main. So in order to make this pass, we need to go back to our main method of, uh, of student, a page down here, and uh, okay, I'm going to have it return system.exit of one. Let's go back and uh, run our test again with, what was it? Option shift F10. Yep. Run everything there. It goes and rebuilds on my code. And hey, I've got this thing passing now. Good deal, but now this thing is still failing. Uh, this uh, goes off invoke main. Let's see here. Invoking main with no arguments prints missing arguments to standard error. Uh, okay, and so I go off and invoke main again. And I assert that standard the, the stuff that was written to standard error contains string missing command line arguments. Again, we're not we're not um, writing anything to uh, standard error. So let's go back and change our main method to write something to standard error. Of course, I need to do that before I exit print line. What was it? Missing arguments. Missing command line arguments? What was it? Missing command line arguments. Okay, let's rerun this. Hey, everybody's passing. Okay, so we just went through the... the too bad I don't have an Uncle Bob hat. Actually, it's probably it's okay they don't have an Uncle Bob hat. Um, so we went through the red, went through, now everything's green. Let's see if there's any opportunity oop, to refactor. That's nice and fast. Um, well, we didn't change that much code. Um, you know what, there is something that, that we could change. You know, here we have some duplicate code, like, uh, you know, invoke main student.class, it's twice. You know, let's, um, he put this stuff into a setup method. I don't really like to do that, but uh, what the heck? Let's just um, let's just eliminate this duplicate code because I have invoke main up here uh, of student class. I have invoke main down there. Let's um, remove that copying, uh, remove that cut and paste code by by introducing a new method. I can go up to the refactor menu and I can say extract. I want to extract that expression into a method. Which is what is that? That is um, option command M for extract method. So this is going to create a new method in my class. Get main method result. Well, I want to just call it invoke main. And IntelliJ says, "Oh look, I found another code fragment. It looks just like that one. Do you want to use that same method?" I'm going to say yes. Okay. So oh, but I put it down here. I want to move it up a little bit. Which I think what is that? If I say, what is it, command, shift, up arrow, I move the method up. In general, um, and actually Uncle Bob has some things to say about this in, in, uh, in his book and in the, uh, in the clean code stuff, about the order in which your methods occur and um, how, uh, like for instance, you know, it's, it's, it's a good practice to keep uh, your methods close to each other. And I think, I can't remember now if he says that methods should be declared before they're used or after they're used. I like to have mine declared before they're used. Anyway, okay, that was good. You know, I, so so I was able to refactor that code there. Um, these these names are super long. I mean, invoking main with no arguments has exit code of one. Um, I'm going to change that because it's just too. They're, they're, they both um, invoke. They, they're always they're both invoking main. I think all the tests are going to be invoking main. So I'm just going to rename that, and I can go up to refactor and then rename. So shift F6. I just want to call it. Oops. I just want to call it no arguments has exit code of one. Shift F six to remain to rename, and then no arguments prints missing arguments of standard error. Okay. Done some refactoring. I'm going to run my tests again. Actually, I'm just going to go. Control Shift F ten. Yep. To run it again. Oops, it only did one of them. I want to do all of them. Yay, everybody's passing. Okay, good. 
I want to do another checkpoint. I'm going to commit uh, my changes to git. By the way, one of the reasons that I commit is that uh, let's say I start refactoring or I start writing stuff and I realize I want to throw it away. I can revert back to this last checkpoint really easily with git. So, got the unit tests passing. Yeah, still got those three warnings. Go ahead and commit it. Okay. Whew. Oh, ding. Okay. Well, then, actually, this is a good stopping point. We got our unit test passing. Um, let's take a break for a little bit, and we'll come back, and then we'll try to figure out, okay, what else do we need to do to get our program running? Okay, let's take 15 minutes. Thanks. Oh, do you, can we do them after the break? Okay. They'll get more complex. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the question was, wow, these are pretty simple test cases. Uh, yes, unit tests are meant to be simple. Um, and they're really meant to be very specific also. They test a unit of work. And so it's really sort of like the minimal setup that you need to do to sort of set the stage, perform some operation, and then assert something about that operation. And so, yeah, you shouldn't have like, you know, three pages of code to, to do a simple unit test. If, you're, if there's that much setup involved, there's that much validation, um, either one of two things. Either it's testing more than a unit test should. So if you find yourself having to connect to the database and set up a bunch of data, that's not a unit test, right? These should be really fast to run. Also, if you find yourself asserting a whole bunch of things, those should probably be broken down into multiple tests. Um, yeah, so anyway, answer your question? Okay, cool. 15 minutes, thank you very much.